Good morning, everybody. Today's scripture reading is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 5, verse 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. We doing church. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jun Ha. You can call me June. I serve as an intern here on staff, and it's a joy to be with you and to share in God's word and offer some reflections. I know we lost an hour of sleep today, so thank you for um, coming out. If you've been journeying with us, we've been in a sermon series through the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews. For me, at least, has been a complex book, but also a beautiful book. Pastor Tori, he likened it to an odd uncle in the family of scriptures. There are warnings and exhortations. There's encouragements and promises, um, and also tender words of comfort um, and assurance. It can be puzzling, but there is this tone of firm love throughout this letter. Um, Hebrews is, is an odd uncle, but there is... Um, a tone of firm love, and he wants the best for us, and he loves us. And the theme that the author keeps unpacking is that Jesus is better. He's the better word. He's the better glory, better Moses, better model. And as we looked at last week, he's the better rest. Um, Jesus is better than all that we can think or imagine. And today we're going to look at Jesus, the better sympathizer. And our main idea is that Let's draw near to Christ as we hold fast to him. And our roadmap will be, um, we'll look at our ascended priest, our compassionate priest, and we have an invitation to draw near. First, our ascended priest. In verse 14, the author writes, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Some translations say a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. He tells us because he's ascended to hold fast, to hold firm to our confession. But why? Why is Christ's ascension important for us here? Well, when we remember the context, the Jewish Christians have faced persecution. It seems like they're in the midst of some persecution. It looks like there's an oncoming persecution. Pain and suffering has colored their lives, and it's the air they breathe. And the writer is aware that what his readers are going through could cause them to abandon who they believe. He knows that as they're persecuted for their faith, they're tempted to drift back, go back to the ways of the old covenant, ways that are more convenient, uh, ways of maybe possibly compromising their faith that could be more acceptable in their current moment. And so the constant note the writer strikes is to hold fast. We have heard that a few times already, and we'll hear it again. He doesn't want their suffering to make them abandon their Savior. He doesn't want their circumstance to make them abandon their Christ. And the writer has the same desire for us. We, we go through a lot. Perhaps we may not experience the same sufferings as the original readers did, but we too can be weighed down by the trials and the tribulations of life. We go through loss, grief, physical and emotional pain, mental distress, and at the very least there seems to be this constant hum of death and despair in our human existence. And so the author here gives us a vision of the ascended Christ. We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. And to use the language of last week, Christ has entered his eternal rest. If you remember, God finished 
the work of creation and entered his rest. Christ finishes the work of salvation and enters his rest. Hebrews 1.3 says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Earlier in that same chapter, it says that Christ is now crowned with glory and honor. The writer is trying to have his readers fix their gaze away from what they are going through to where they are in Christ. Christ has come, he's defeated sin and death, resurrected, ascended, and is now seated on his throne, ruling and reigning. He's the victorious one. And by holding fast to him and trusting and being united to him, we too are victorious. Paul says that in Ephesians 2 that we have been raised with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. This is true of you right now. No matter how bleak your reality has been or how bleak your reality will be, our truer and deeper reality is that we have overcome and are seated with the ascended Christ. It's in Christ we have already overcome and will overcome the world. Church, whatever value, value, whatever value you may be in, you can be assured of your victory. Um, and that difficulty that you're going through is an already defeated difficulty. We can participate now in his victory and rest. Pain and suffering may color our lives here on earth, but it doesn't define us, and it's not the last word on our lives. So let's hold fast to our ascended priest but also the writer shows us our compassionate priest. Verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. The writer urges us to hold fast to our ascended priest, but also we have a compassionate priest. As we have just discussed, we have the victory through Christ, and one day we will rule and reign with him. We will rule and reign with him in the eternal rest of God. But the author knows that the time in between is hard, especially for his original readers. The work has been accomplished, and there is a future rest coming. But right now, we walk with a limp. We are victorious people, but we also are a limping people. We're not immune to the fragility of a fallen world. To hold fast to God, to stay trusting in him in this life is hard. And so the author tells us, we have a high priest that not only ascended, but also descended among men and shared in our weakness. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, every high priest is chosen from among men. And in verse 2, that the high priest is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Christ, our high priest, also is not immune to pain and suffering. And this makes him gentle, and it makes him compassionate with us. Writer Henry Nowen says this, compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who mourn, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of being human. Christ entered our pain, and he fully immersed in our human condition. Isaiah 53 states that he is a man of sorrows. And later in chapter 5, it says, He offered up prayers with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. The Satan in Matthew 4 tempts him to with, with wealth, power, and fame. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, in light of the eternal cup of wrath before him. You can only imagine the in agony he felt in submitting to the will of God. He's someone who grieved the loss of a friend, who was betrayed by those closest to him, who was mocked, scorned, beaten, and eventually crucified in the most horrific act of injustice. There's nothing we go through in our human experience that he can't relate to. He fully identifies with the human experience and fully identifies with you. He understands you and knows you. Um, this past summer, my dad had to go into the hospital. He had a pretty bad hernia and he had to get some extensive surgery done and he was in the hospital for about a month recovering. And one of the nights I had a conversation uh, with him that's really stuck with me to this day. Um, as we were talking, um, 
that night, he started to reflect on my mom. My mom passed away about like a year and a half ago, and she had kidney failure and was on dialysis for about six to seven years. Um, our, our family's life shifted and revolved around her care and her needs. Um, and during those years, my mom's health declined. It declined, she had multiple surgeries done, her strength diminished, but out of a desire for her to get better, we would tell her to watch what she ate, watch her diet, to be more active, um, and to move around. But most of the time, she was laid up in bed, sitting and watching TV. And from our perspective as a family, it seemed like she had just given up on life. Um, and this frustrated us. And at times, we would express our frustration by saying things like, why aren't you eating better? Why are you always laying down? Do you not care how much we're sacrificing for you? you know, what's the point of us taking care of you if you don't want to take care of yourself? But as my, <clears throat> as my dad was laid up in the hospital, uh, struggling from his surgery, weak and unable to move, um, he said to me, Chuna, I think I understand your mom now. I think I now know why she was the way she was. It was my dad uh, experiencing my mother's weakness that gave him understanding and a better knowledge of where she was coming from. And I could sense a sense of regret that he wasn't more gentle, a sense of regret that he wasn't more compassionate. And, it's, and I think it's this shared experience of suffering that bursts compassion. And in an infinitely greater way, Christ understands us and he knows us because he has experienced what it's like to be human. Whatever struggle you came in here with, he understands that struggle. Yes, he tells us to hold fast, to believe and stay trusting, but Christ knows that we live in a world of kidney failure and dialysis clinics, of earthquakes, of suicide and suffering, of death and disease. Therefore, he's gentle. He's compassionate towards us. He understands our weakness to hold fast, and he knows our desires at times to want to let go. <clears throat> In those moments, he's not harsh. You know, he doesn't say, hey, why is it so hard for us, for you to, to hold fast? Um, but in our weakness, he speaks to us with love and says, hey, I know that it's not easy. I know it can be hard. It's, it's okay. We have a wellspring of compassion in him, and it's this compassion and gentleness that will never end. When he ascended, he did not cease to be human. He still has his wounds, and so forever we can count on his gentleness and compassion. And it's this gentleness and compassion that creates a safe space for us to draw near. Verse 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The throne we draw near to is a throne of grace. And the one seated on that throne is one who has wounds. This throne is a safe space for us. In the presence of one who knows what it's like to be weak, we can share our own weakness. In the presence of one who's been vulnerable, we can be vulnerable. It's in his presence that we can be fully human. And one of the things that I've been personally wrestling with through a lot of these past few years has been fear and anxiety. And one of the fears that's come up uh, for me, has been the fear of losing people's approval and acceptance. And because of this fear, there's this constant worry um, and concern of how people view me, how people think of me. Um, it's kind of put this pressure on myself to feel like I have to edit myself and present myself in a certain way. And it can be exhausting and tiring. But one of the things that's been refreshing to me is when I'm with someone, maybe it's tribe, maybe some good friends of mine, or even strangers, is when they share their weaknesses with me. Their very act of sharing their weakness with me creates this space for me where I can also be weak. When they share their weakness, their wounds with me, it's disarming. I feel like I can breathe and be myself. It's in this meeting of weakness, so to speak, that we can find connection and strength. And this is the kind of safe presence we have when we draw near to Christ, who has shared in our human condition he has set us free, yes, from sin and death, and in the future we will experience the fullness of freedom. But in the present moment, he also gives us the freedom to exist and to be ourselves in his presence. We can bring our weaknesses and wounds to him. And as we bring our wounds to his wounds, 
our weakness to his weakness, we can experience life and healing. And this is what I find so compelling about Christ. And I think this is what our hearts long for. We want someone who's compassionate with us, but we also want someone who can also save us. His wounds, his greatest, his wounds of his greatest moment of weakness is also the wounds that can save. Isaiah 53, 5 says that by his wounds we are healed. Christ, being without sin, Hebrews 4, 15 says, was able to offer himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. And contrary to the priest of the Old Covenant in chapter 5, 5 verse 3, he's not obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, but rather voluntarily offers himself up for us all. His sacrifice for us was purely out of love. He is the better high priest because he isn't just gentle. He doesn't merely empathize with what we go through, but he can save us from the power of sin. He's with us in our messiness, but he's also our Messiah. And furthermore, as we touched upon the first point, Christ passed through the heavens and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He has entered into the heavenly temple, which is to say he's in God's presence right now. And he has gone in there as our representative, interceding for us. And because of his priestly work, he has given us access to the Father in the most holy place where God's presence dwelled in the Old Testament, available only to the high priest in the line of Aaron. And once a year, uh, and gone through only once a year, we have access to any time, anywhere. And when we go, now the Father looks at us through the wounds of Christ. He looks upon Christ's wounds, and the barrier between us and God is now lifted. He looks upon Christ's wounds and sees his wounds of sacrifice in our fractured relationship with him, is restored. He looks upon Christ's wounds of obedience and crowns us with honor and glory as if we endured and held fast through every trial and temptation. He looks at Christ's wounds and lavishes us with mercy, and he looks at us and he looks at Christ's wounds and lavishes us with his grace. And to quote Zephaniah 3:14, he now sings and rejoices over us with gladness, and he exalts over us with loud singing. We have access to the Father. And notice he says to draw near with confidence in the time of need. I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling weak and needy, I'm not feeling very confident. But the beauty of this text is that the source of our confidence is never in ourselves, but it's in our gracious God. And so church, let's draw near with confidence. I don't know what your week looked like, but if you came in here feeling guilt, you can draw near to him and be forgiven. If you came in here feeling rejected, you can draw near to him and receive his acceptance. If you came in here feeling unloved, you can draw near to him and hear him call you beloved. If you came in here feeling overlooked, you can draw near to him who makes you the apple of his eye. And I believe the writer is telling us as a church, Terra Nova, if you're having trouble holding fast, draw near. Church, let's draw near to God as we hold fast to him. And we can directly apply this today after service. Like last week, there will be people here um, who will pray for you, who will talk with you, draw near to God with you. Um, and so please, if you feel the need for prayer, if you want prayer, um, we would love to pray for you. And so as we draw near to this throne of grace, let's also draw near to others. Having access to God, we are now a royal priesthood. We now minister God's compassion as those who know what it's like to be weak and wounded and to live in a fallen world. And as I was thinking about this, the story of doubting Thomas came to mind. In John 20, the disciples show up to Thomas and say, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas doubts. He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Later in that text, Eight days later, Jesus appears to him and shows him his wounds and says, put your finger here and see my wounds. Put out your hand and place it at my side. And Thomas, <clears throat> Thomas believes. And this account makes me wonder that maybe one of the ways that we can show Christ is real. That one of the ways that we can show his power is by showing our own wounds and our own weaknesses. That as we are vulnerable and become this safe presence as we are weak and know what it's like 
to live in this life and as we are compassionate that people would see the power of Christ through our weakness. And so let us be a safe presence that can hold the pain and sorrows of others. Let's walk as we limp. Let's walk with those who limp. And walk with those who limp all the while pointing to him who gives us grace and who gives us mercy. And as the band comes up and we draw near to the communion table, let's take and eat of the emblems of his wounded body and drink of the blood of his wounds and receive his mercy and his grace to be sustained for the journey as we hold fast to him. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. You are abundantly kind to us and you're generous. Um, we thank you that though we don't deserve it, we can draw near to your throne, God. And as, you, as we go to your throne, we see your wounds that flow compassion, that flow forgiveness. And Lord, as we receive your compassion, as we receive your healing, help us to be wounded healers out in this world. And so God, as we draw near to you, give us the strength, give us the mercy to continue to hold on and see you as better. God, you are the, the great high priest, and God, you are better than anything else that we can think or imagine. So God, help us to hold fast to you.